Gabrielle. It's the man that always asks, answers my question when I say who or what is an alumni. What's alumni? Past you, absolutely. So, following that trend, Adele Brooks is alumni. She is a past master's student from Greenwich University. <laughs> Even more, she mastered with distinction. So, I like to follow. <laughs> there cannot be anybody sitting out there who doesn't know what Stockwell Street is as an entity, as a project. If you don't know in about an hour's time, you most definitely will do. Uh, some of you I know have been to Stockwell Street as a site visit. For the building surveyors in the audience, you need to concentrate. Your professional practice in semester two is relevant or will be relevant to Stockwell Street. For the remainder of you, your FM assignments in semester two will be relevant to Stockwell Street. So that's the reason to stay awake for at least an hour. Um, your second reasoning for staying awake is on the conclusion of this presentation, Nicola's going to go through some generic feedback on your formative assignments. So it's not an hour of Adele and then you're out, it is a full session today. I'm going to leave Adele to do her own presentation. Lots of key learning points specific to project management, lots of key learning points relative to risk as well. spaces. There's two TV studios, um, a double pipe TV studios that are fantastic, almost BBC standard in them. Um, there's a new cafe, some retail space and pretty much the new studio floor for the School of Architecture. So it's big, where you've got two studios here, it's a big, large open space. There's some details on this um, actual construction that you can have a look at and we've given you a bit of an overview of you know, elements that go in to make up the building. Uh, so, 
site context in history, well, a project needs to be brought about for a reasoning. What the reasoning was behind this project was that, yes, the School of Architecture for years had been placed in Avery Hill and they've always wanted to be located as a central London school. Um, Greenwich is obviously a campus we already have and they, we've been looking around in the Estates Department, not personally, but the Estates Department have been looking around for a number of years for a piece of land. A piece of land came up to suit the brief that would, was given about 10 years ago for a project to move this entire school up there and the piece of land, or lo and behold, was twice the size of what we were actually looking for. Now, as things unfold, uh, the land itself, just as an example for you, to set out the project, it was twice the size, but it was an absolute steal. It was in the crash of 2008, 2009, the banking crisis. The actual owner of the land at the time needed cash funds quick and fast, and we made an offer, which was far less than what the land was valued at, and they accepted. So, you get your project starting, but actually the brief for your project kind of goes out the window because you get a bit of land that's far bigger than what you actually wanted. So, we then revisited the brief. Whilst doing that, before I launch into that, you have all had an overview of what Project Manager is. I'm sure you're fully aware of it, but just to give you an idea, um, the brief and the objectives, um, understanding the client and understanding the project. That's the first bit I've talked about. Already we have a bit of land that is bigger than what we wanted. We have a brief and we have a client, which is us, and how we manage the rest of the process. We then had to reset the objectives based on the size of the land. We then established a feasibility of the land. So we had cost consultants come in, um, external consultants, QSs to the university who already worked with the university, and we agreed a budget and a time scale for how we could achieve the building. And then the job for me is to deliver the client's objectives along with an external project manager, which I'll go into. So, this just gives you an overview of the piece of land here. Of course, when you're maximising value on a land, a piece of land like this in Greenwich, you don't leave a lot of room around the edges. We fully built across the entire site where possible. And we tried to maximise the height of the building because the most value you're going to get is for using the most, most of your land, basically, rather than leaving gaps here and there. So you can see the next image below pretty much takes up the entire site. Now, when you're looking at your objectives, one of the things is that the building is located in a World Heritage Site, so all of these processes had to be, I suppose, thought about very much early at the beginning when you're looking at your project and outlining what you need. Yeah, you could put a 20-storey building on view, but would you get to a World Heritage Site? No. So these were established knowing the parameters that we took on board. Um, this talks about it in a bit more detail. What we did is uh, develop the brief, understand who the stakeholders are. So I touched on that. World Heritage Site were one of the stakeholders. Yes, we knew we couldn't put up a 20 story building in this location, so obviously our brief was built in and around that. Establish the, uh, agree the roles and responsibilities of all parties involved. We have to date over 60 groups of consultants on this project of which the university and the project manager, who's external as well, manage. So it is our responsibility to manage the 60 groups of consultants and how they all fit in. And you would think, oh my God, that's just ridiculous. Well, I'm going to tell you it is ridiculous. But um, there is a chain of command and this is a structure that I'll go into in a little bit more detail. We established an affordable project budget. Now, that is a good one because Although we, it is £76 million that the university invested in, we knew that we had to achieve our criteria of our brief for a per square metre rate, and then we knew that we had to build in a World Heritage Site. We built this in the middle of the Olympics. There were a huge number of parameters that went into costing all of that up and time scale, and knowing that we possibly would have a downtime of eight weeks during the Olympics, that was factored in. So just little things like that, forecasting a number of years ahead to know where we wanted to end up was part of the process in the initial stages. Um, to which I would say it never gets frozen. You're constantly moving and making this a malleable beast. Stretch, stretching. Um, so establishing key risks, which I will touch on in a minute as well, and managing change to facilitate making a decision. I think one of the examples that's worth noting is you'll see these are just a group of staff in the building. The university doesn't have internally 
any structure or formal process um, as to how you might input into a building. So the key ethos that we decided to undertake as part of this brief development was looking at everything that we wanted to put in the building and taking a user group out of it. So to date, for the last four years, I've been working with about 200 people in, internally within the university to bring them on board to help design the process. So the librarians have had input into the design of the library the whole way through the process. But constantly we're signing it off in stages. So we've used the RIVA guideline to sign it off at stages so that they can't revisit something that they've already signed off. Otherwise you would never get to the end of your building. Now what that does for a role like mine is it means that you have to start educating everybody what RIVA is, what the stages are, how they work, because you're a construction industry group of people, you all know these kind of things, but when you get your librarians on board and they say what's RIVA stage D, and that's the bit where you say in RIVA stage D you sign off your furniture, your power, your data, your outlets, you need to provide them with a structure. And this was all set out from day one at RIVA stage B. So I'll go back. Now, one thing that I will touch on, which I can't stress enough, and hopefully um, you take this on board for your careers, is the contract. Um, the contract really dictates the whole ethos of the project in this instance. If you decide for a design build, your structure and your key project plan are based around the design build contract and that is how it operates. For this project, we knew that we had a budget for the university, we were digging down, which you have seen, this is the archaeological work, but we were digging down into a World War II bomb site. So we knew there were unknowns, we knew that asbestos buildings had been hit in the bombs and then they filled the holes in and then they just built petrol stations over the top of it. So we knew we had contaminated land, we knew we had uh, a V2 bomb to deal with, we knew we were possibly going to come across rockets and bits and pieces, of which we did. Uh, we knew we had an eight-week program of an archaeological dig that we had to do as agreed with English Heritage. So the most expensive and risky part of any project is digging down. And for us to eliminate that risk, we, we dangled the carrots effectively. We split the contract in two. Whilst we were designing the building with all of our user groups and our consultant team, we brought the contractor in to start the enabling work. So we were working kind of crossed over. We're designing on the top of the building while the contract is digging down doing the enabling works. And because we split them in two, we had a contract for enabling works and we had a contract for the main build. And what we said to the contractor was, we'll take you on board to do the enabling works. You prove to us that you're efficient, you can deliver, you're on time, you're on budget. And we will then negotiate with you the price of the main contract and you will be first in line to win that. So overall, the enabling works was four million pound worth of works, just digging a hole and piling, a bit of concrete, okay? Um, also very risky. And the contractor proved their whole process through a year's worth of enabling works that they were able to also input into our design. So when we said the architects come back, and forgive me, I'm an architect, so I know how outlandish they can be. Um, they've come back and they said, we want this staircase hung and suspended from the ceiling. And the contractor says, you need to be supporting it here, here and here. And we couldn't crane that in in one piece, so we crane it in in three pieces. So that whilst we were designing, we were using them to sit at the table to tell us an efficiency of building material products and how the process would work. So you're kind of dangling the carrot, and this, for us, is absolutely crucial. And the only way we had that was because the contract was set up in a two-stage process like this. So whilst they finished the enabling works, and might I say, on time and under budget, big tick. We signed a contract with them for a deal to start in March <coughs> two years ago to complete the construction of the job by January 2014. Now we're a few months behind. A few things happened that um, are inevitable and we can go into those in a bit more detail. But they proved that while we were dangling that carrot, we got the enabling works on time and on budget, which is really, really hard to achieve and was done. And then they also did a good deal with us for the main contract. So I would say to you, it's key to working out what your goals are and achievements are. The university knew it wasn't going to be late. They wanted to move in academic year September 2014, and we're on track for that, even though the contractors are a bit late and they have themselves a few months contingency, although it's getting tight. 
Um, and we knew that we wanted to be on budget because the university didn't want to be spending money that they would want to spend on students on a building that was overrunning just because the contractor missed a couple of things here or there or however it works with your design team. Um, or your architects overrate something. So we've kept an absolute tight control of that the whole way through. And this contract selection of the two-stage process and dangling, what I would say in common terms, dangling the carrot, really worked for us. Um, the project execution plan, I mean, this is fairly standard stuff. You get this out of a textbook, this is what it tells you and this is how it works. Um, just to give you a bit of an idea, this is the basement in the building um, and the rooftop of the building is this here. The reason why we show you these two, in terms of project execution plan, we're using, uh, we're, as we finish the roof off, we're using the rooftop as storage because I showed you the image before and we talk about um, the, the site and the building taking up the whole entire site. So in Greenwich, you're in a World Heritage site, you can't store anything outside the site. So the project execution plan was making sure that everybody knew who was working together, how we all work together, who are our stakeholders, what's happening, who we need to take on board, and I highlight that one because they are huge in the world of uh, construction. Network rail are extremely difficult to deal with and you need to be on constant track with them, pardon the pun. Um, and the, they are one of the biggest stakeholders. They can stop your site within the flick of a phone call. They, if they see anything going anywhere near their track or anything that's um, untoward, your entire site shuts down immediately. And it will take you two to three weeks to get it back up and running for them to then approve the safe working next to their tracks. Uh, so these kind of things need to be seriously considered when you're looking at process. Um, if there's any questions as we go through on any one of these aspects, just let me know because I can go into a detail on an example. Um, so we've given you the brief. The consultants, this is just a list. Our main consultants, Henny and Peng. The building itself was run as a competition and that's how the university set it out in its brief. The reasoning for the building to be the way it is is that at the vice chancellor at the time, um, Baroness Blackstone, wanted a world-class facility of architecture with a world-class building and world-class architects. So that formed part of the brief, which is how we have what we have. Um, we have project managers, structural engineers, services, Hawley, sustainability consultants as well, planners. These guys are absolutely key to this project, planning consultants. Because we're at a World Heritage site, they are constantly getting sign-offs and discharge conditions for pretty much us sneezing. Anything we choose to do, like change the way the truck might arrive at site or leave the site, if it's not prior agreed, then we need planning discharge and planning conditions and traffic management. Greenwich is extremely precious and tight about how the town centre operates. Um, quantity surveyor at Fanshawe. Uh, you, you might decide in your future career whether this is a good thing or not. Our quantity surveyor and our project manager of the same company. Um, now, in hindsight, this may be a benefit or a detriment. Some people prefer to keep them separate. Uh, and so others have like to have them close at hand. I think in this project it's been an absolute benefit to have the project manager and the quantity surveyor within one company because nothing gets signed off and there's clear communication chain between them two immediately. Also that's important because that was set out in the brief that the university didn't want to go over budget. So for us it's crucial, but in other projects that you might come across you'll find it is a different process. Um, this is just... Uh, just an organisational structure, which um, I know you'll be learning more about in the future, but this just gives you an idea of how this project works in particular. We have a court of governors, so the university is um, governed by a group um, who we call, refer to as the court. We then have a small steering group, which we meet once a month for the entire project, of which sits the vice chancellor, um, Mark Norris, who is the financial operating officer, and then the heads of the schools who are moving into the building. So Neil Spiller as the Dean of the School of Architecture and Construction. And then you have um, the deans of the um, other schools, the head of the library. So we have a small cluster of people who are able to have input and make immediate decisions on the building. Um, you then have myself and my department. So Peter Fotheringham uh, is my boss, the head of estates. And we then have those user groups I was telling you about. Now they're key because they're outside the project team, and the project team are the hired consultants, and we are the university team. So 
our librarians will have a direct input into what happens <coughs> into the building, whether they want their, you know, book return shoot over there or over there. You know, these are key decisions that they have um, about the design of the building and how the space works. And then those decisions are fed through us into the project team. So the user groups, we also, um, because I prefer it that way, have direct link with the architects, the building surveyors, the structural engineer, the quantity surveyor, so that if the library want to make a decision about something, then I'm quite happy for them to have a chain email, which we send around, and I do it and operate as a reasonable policy, so that they know if they make that decision, it has an open impact on the time, project cost, project time, project process. Um, if they want glass walls instead of petition walls, then it does affect the daylight criteria. It affects a whole raft of things that, okay, as a librarian, you could be asking for one thing, but it has a large chain and a knock on it. It's important for them to understand this so that they don't make decisions saying, we want this, we want that, without realising there are knock on any implications. And that's purely a communication process in a project. And I would encourage you to try and keep a chain of that in your future career. Because quite often, once you explain the validation for a reasoning of something, they're absolutely on board and they say, oh yeah, that makes sense, okay, we don't need that. And that's how I operate. I don't have to tell you yes or no, I don't have to dictate anything to any of you, I ask you the question. The library says to me, we must have um, a glazed door entry to the group study room, and I'll say, okay, why, what, when, where and how, basic questioning, and then they, they'll give you the validation and then I'll give it to the architects in through an email chain and the architects will explain, yes, that meets the daylight criteria, no, it doesn't meet the DDA if we take it out. And then there's a reasoning behind everything and how it's done. And then they're educated as the process of the building moves forward. The reasoning for this also is that when they move into the building, they understand about how the design works because the biggest problem that the construction industry has at the moment and you'll learn more about this as you go forward is soft landings is that when you hand a building over all the construction knowledge to date leaves with the design and project team and the user ends up saying how do i turn the lights on like oh they're all on sensor excellent stop moving so these things are absolute educational tools and this is really important for the future construction industry that you pick that up and you're aware that when you're designing a building the users at the end of the day need to know what you've put into it. What was actually more important? Time, cost, time, cost, or quality? Uh, Which one was actually more important? So you've seen the triangle, you all know it. Yeah. What happens when you push one element in the triangle, the other part moves? Constantly, every assessment we make is yes, it's validated on those three elements. And my question to the librarian is based on those three elements. And does the library need this? Does it have to happen tomorrow? Could we install it when we move into the building? Is it something that you think you might want to test you need? You know, all of these factors come into play. So number one instance is uh, balanced either way. I'll, I'll give you an example, a classic example. That we're battling right now on the site. We have these amazing stairs. I should show you a photo, actually. Wait, wait, wait. We have these amazing stairs and we've paid it's part of the design ethos of the building. Okay, that thing on. Right, see this? If you, when you enter the building, there is a, one set of stairs on either side of the building. It is uh, a main stair, it is steel. It's like a big train track, if I was to describe it to you. And it's like a huge escalator, it's a stair. It's wide, it's steel, and it's got a concrete infill step. So, what we've said is there's no zinc and everything's precast, but there is reinforcing in the step. So we've got a precast nosing all of it in steel, and the only bit that will go in, we we're going to have precast infills of concrete, but now we're pouring them in, in situ. Why? Because when we initially started the job about a year and a half ago, we had a price from the concreter at the time that said it would cost me five grand to fill those little treads with concrete, right? Then when they gave that price, we've, we've looked at it and it didn't meet the specification. So they've gone back and said, oh actually you wanted treads to be dark grey, well we're pouring a grey, light grey concrete, but you wanted it to be dark grey, let's have another think about that. So we sent that to the contractor and said you need to think about this. And this open book process is 
Absolutely crucial because you wouldn't normally know. I wouldn't normally know what a subcontractor is thinking. I wouldn't normally see the price from the subcontractor, who are FDL, who are concreters, and I wouldn't normally be able to lay the A's on this, but we can, so we understand how it all comes together. So they've said, right, five grand to infill the treads on these stairs. Cool. The Osborne are now ready to infill the treads on the stairs, and FDL are off site because they're running behind a program. Wait a minute, your two trains don't match up, right? So what do they do? They have to bring in another trade to infill the trade of the stairs. So that trade comes in and they've said to us, if you infill the trade of the, the, the tread of the stairs to your specification, making it dark black concrete, we'll infill the tread, we have to hand shake a material on it, we then trowel it so you get a smooth finish as per your specification, and you need to do two treads and then wait for the next one to dry, so you can't step on it as you go which means that will take us seven weeks with a gang of seven people because there's no way for you to get concrete up the building except wheelbarrowing it because the cranes are off site as of this weekend. Uh, that'll be £35,000 a stair. I'm sorry, what? So, when you say time, cost, quality, <laughs> you're pushing all three of those things out the window absolutely now. First of all, Osborne have coughed up because actually they should have done it in the same time that trade is on site. Second of all, it's a price way beyond what we had in the budget, so the cost is gone, the program is gone, and the quality, well that's the bit you have to compromise, isn't it? The architects have signed up a specification, it's in the contract, Osborne are required to produce that specification, and should they not, then they don't need the quality. So what do you do? I don't know, stay tuned, I'll let you know next week. <laughs> so, so this is where we are, and at the table you have myself as the client, the project manager, you have your QS, you have the concreters, you have the outside external concreters giving you advice, and you're questioning them on the methodology, the men it takes on site, why do we need the shape mix, the architect's sitting at the table saying it's in the specification, but actually the only thing that I can see being pushed at the moment is the quality to achieve some, something of a reasonable cost, and the program. Now Osborne is saying, it's a wet trade, you'll know about that, it's concrete, you don't do a wet trade any other time than when the flooring's not in. We've already put uh, raised access floors through most locations, and this stair winds the whole way up the building. There's a glass roof on the stair already, so you can't concrete it in from, crane it in from top. So yeah, it's a bit of a challenge. We'll get there, we'll get over every other one, we'll get over this one, but at the moment, all three have gone out the window for time, cost and quality, and we're all going to have to compromise to get it so that you can walk up a set of stairs when we move in next year. So yeah, good, good question. Um, click back to where we were. I think, and if I'm right about that situation, what will end up happening is we'll push Osborne because it's their programming and you're recording this. So let's see if we get but yeah, let's see if I'm right in six months' time and we can go back and watch this video. Um, I'll sit at the table at Push Osborne because they signed the contract and it's in their specification. Um, because their time and labour on site is far more expensive, we have a right within the contract, and this comes back to how you sign it, that our QX has the ability to negotiate what is fair and reasonable and the quality we're going to potentially compromise on maybe two layers of troweling, we might have to go down to one so it's slightly bubblier. But there will be a compromise in absolutely every factor in all of that. Yeah, so you've recorded this now, so you'll be able to tell me in that six months time when we're right. Um, and then we have decision making processes, pre and post contract. So I've given you an overview of what's in the contract now and how things are made, but this is pre-contract. Um, you, you'll be so surprised. Do you think the architect can fly in from Ireland? This is where they come from. They fly in from Ireland, they have a vision of a building, and this is the building that you see today. Absolutely no way. Pre-contract, -con, pre you're in the process of um, going through planning, and this is really where your building is fully designed. Yes, we have design team meetings, and we have, they're our design team, and they've got the ethos and what the building wants. But the people that come into it really are the governing bodies. English Heritage, World Borough of Greenwich, Boris Johnson and the GLA, um, because of the size of the building and the scale and the context of it. Um, I, I refer to him as Bojo, so does everybody else, but Bojo decided whether he did or didn't like one of the corners and the facade of the building, and we had to get approval from everybody. And they can push and pull this. 
So the stone facade came from um, an area of the Greenwich Town Centre. We were looking at glass and steel initially, and it wasn't well received by the local Greenwich um, constituency of the, the borough, the World Heritage Site, the neighbours, you name it. So we ended up with a stone facade, which I showed you at the beginning. So actually,